Hello and welcome to the new book releases for the week of February the 19th. This definitely seems to be the week of duologies, most of them the beginnings of that one, but one or two are the ends of a duology. I'm Morgan if you haven't been here before, and while this week's list is a tad bit shorter, it will still be separated by genre for you to click around. Let's go ahead and get started. And we start off in Romanticy with the first up duology, These Monstrous Gods, its first book, To Cage a God by Elizabeth May. Using ancient secrets, Galena and Sarah's mother grafted gods into their bones, bound to a brutal deities and granted forbidden power no commoner had held in a millennia. The sisters have grown up to become living weapons, raised to overthrow an empire, no matter the cost. With their mother gone and their country on the brink of war, it falls to the sisters to take the helm of the rebellion and end the cruel reign of a royal family possessed by destructive gods. Because when the ruling Aurelia invade, they conquer with fire and blood, and when they clash, common folk burn. Our other romanticy isn't so much of a novel, it is the compendium in the blood and ash, flesh and fire universe, Visions of Flesh and Blood by Jennifer L. Armitrout and Raven Salvador. This one is supposed to be a comprehensive companion guide for background history, reader, favorite information, art, and reference materials told from the point of view of Miss Willa herself. Having only read the first book ever in that series, I don't know who that is. But if you are into finding out more about the world and the lore and the art, now we move into fantasy. Our first one up being Reaping Demons by Evie Langlius. This is the first in the Scythe and Souls series. I'm going to call it a series because I don't think it's a duology. I think this is a series. Turns out there are monsters in the world. Why couldn't my midlife crisis involve a new hairstyle? I went from ordinary working gal to demon killer. Sounds exciting. Not really, seeing as how I got fired from my job, my apartment was trashed, and the cops think I'm involved in something shady. Especially that cute detective who keeps questioning me. Pity there's no time to flirt. What with all the demons that keep emerging from sewer grates and subway tunnels, something has to be done before they overrun the city, if only that something didn't involve me. I never asked to become a heroine, but apparently I've been chosen, and now I must reap what fate has bestowed before chaos is sown. I like the sound of this one because she does sound like an older heroine, so that sounds like it could be fun. Next is one that I really thought released last year, but that could have just been its UK release, and then we got it from, you know, a UK book box, thus adding to my confusion. It's Son of Blood and Ruin by Marley Lars. This is a Zorro retelling. A new legend begins. In 16th century New Spain, witchcraft is punishable by death. Indigenous temples have been destroyed, and tales of mythical creatures that once roamed the land have become whispers in the night. Hidden behind a mask, Pantera uses her magic and legendary swordplay skills to fight the tyranny of Spanish rule. To all who know her, Lenora de la Casas Tazantin never leaves the palace and is promised to the heir of the Spanish throne. The respectable, law-abiding Lady Leonora faints at the sight of blood and would rather be caught dead than meddle in court affairs. No one suspects that Lenora and Pantera are the same person. Lenora's charade is tragically good, and with magic running through her veins, she's nearly invincible. Nearly. Despite her mastery, she is destined to die young in battle, as predicted by a seer. What does tragically good mean in context to her charade, though? I question. We move now into our YA slash new adult fantasy. And I'm going to say that, because I think that anything that puts steamy in, as part of its description, it's not YA. They don't need to have unrealistic expectations until they're actually in the real world, and then we can devolve into not having realistic expectations. I'm sorry, that's just, I can't. <laughs> this is going to be Heartless Hunter, though, by Kristen Cesellerini. This is the first of the Crimson Moth duology, though. On the night Rune's life changed forever, blood ran in the streets. Now in the aftermath of a devastating revolution, witches have been diminished from powerful rulers to outcasts ruthlessly hunted due to their waning magic and Rune must hide what she is. Spending her days pretending to be nothing more than a vapid young socialite, Rune spends her nights as the Crimson Moth, a witch vigilante who rescues her kind from being perched. When a rescue goes wrong, she decides to throw the witch hunters off her scent and gain the intel she desperately needs by courting the handsome Gideon Sharp a notorious and unforgiving witch hunter loyal to the revolution who she can't help but find herself falling for. Gideon loathes the decadence and superficiality Rune represents, but when he learns the Crimson Moth has been using Rune's merchant ships to smuggle renegade witches out of the Republic, he inserts himself into her social circles by pretending to court her right back. He soon realizes that beneath the beauty and shallow fascade is someone fiercely intelligent and tender who feels like his perfect match, except what if she's the very villain he's hunting for? 
So you have Witch and Witch Hunter, which I feel like we've seen a lot of this lately. I'm not saying that it doesn't sound intriguing. I'm just saying, it's, I don't know. Without having read it, which I do believe this is going to be the Alcrate YA, I can't actually comment on the steamy part. But if it is, we'll move on though from that little rant, sorry for that, A Tempest of Tea by Hasafa Fazil. I'm very sorry, I can't pronounce it. I'm very sorry, I know I butchered it. It's the first book though in Blood and Tea duology. On the streets of White Roaring, Arthi Casimir is a criminal mastermind and collector of secrets. Her prestigious tea room transforms into an illegal bloodhouse by night, catering to the vampires feared by society. But when her establishment is threatened, Arthi is forced to strike an unlikely deal with an alluring adversary to save it. She can't do the job alone. Calling on some of the city's most skilled outcasts, Arthi hatches a plan to infiltrate the sinister, glittering vampire society known as the Arthurium. But not everyone in her ragtag crew is on her side, and as the truth behind the heist unfolds, Arthi finds herself in the midst of a conspiracy that will threaten the world as she knows it. This one is also going to be a book box book. I think this one's Alcrate and the other one's Fairy Loot. Or the other way around. Then we have The Bad Ones by Melissa Albert. Goddess, goddess, count to five. In the morning, who's alive? In the course of a single winter's night, four people vanish without a trace across a small town. Nora's estranged best friend Becca is one of the lost. As Nora tries to entangle the truth of Becca's disappearance, she discovers the darkness in her town's past, as well as a string of coded messages Becca left for her to unravel. These clues lead Nora to a piece of local lore, a legendary goddess of forgotten origins who played a role in Nora and Becca's own childhood games. Lastly, we are concluding the Seven Faceless Saints duology with Disciples of Chaos the N.K. Lob. The first book starts out in the city of Umbrasia, where saints and their disciples rule with terrifying and unjust power, playing favorites while the unfavored struggle sur to survive. <laughs> After her father's murder at the hands of the Umbrasian military, Rosanna is willing to do whatever it takes to dismantle the corrupt system, tapping into her powers as a disciple of patience, joining the rebellion and facing the boy who broke her heart. As the youngest captain in the history of the Palazzo security, Damien Venturi is expected to be ruthless and strong to serve the saints with unquestioning devotion, but three years spent fighting in a never-ending war have left him with the deeper scars than he wants to admit and fear of confronting the girl he left behind. Now a murderer stalks Ambrosio's citizens as the body count climbs the Palazzo is all too happy to look the other way, that is, until a disciple becomes the newest victim. Our sci-fi for the week is described as Air Force One meets the Martian with a dash of knives out. Interesting combination. It's called Exit Black by Joe Pitikin. Imperium is the most expensive structure ever created. Once an orbiting laboratory is now a space hotel for the fantastically wealthy. But as the station preps for its first group of space tourists, Dr. Chloe Bonilia, Imperium's resident biophysicist, finds herself questioning whether babysitting a pastel of space clampers is worth the distraction from her research. A private rocket delivers a rogues gallery of the world's elite to Imperium. Eccentric billionaires, Calo Tech Bros, a sponsored Instagram influencer, and a seemingly saintly philanthropist. However, posing among the staff are members of a global terrorist group who call themselves the Reckoners, hellbent on appending the economic inequality of the 21st century Earth, and they have a bone to pick with the scions of the 1%. So what I don't understand about that is it says it was a laboratory. And if it's now a hotel, wh why is there still a scientist there? A biophysicist. Why, why is she there and dealing with these people? Our mystery starts a magical fortune cookie series. It's Ill-Fated Fortune by Jennifer Chow. Felicity Jen grew up literally hanging on to mom's apron strings in the magical bakery in the, of the quaint town of Pixie, California. Her mother's enchanted baked goods, including puffy pineapple buns and creamy egg tarts, bring instant joy to all who consume them. Felicity has always been hesitant in the kitchen herself after many failed attempts, but a takeout meal gone wrong inspires her to craft some handmade fortune cookies. They become so popular that Felicity runs out of generic fortunes and starts making her own personalized predictions. When one of the customer's ill-fated fortune results in his murder, Felicity's suspiciously specific fortune has the police focusing on her as the main culprit. Now Felicity must find a way to turn her luck around and get cleared from suspicion. We end the week with our thriller, End of Story, by A.J. Flynn. I'll be dead in three months. Come tell my story. So writes Sebastian Trapp, reclusive mystery novelist, to his longtime correspondent Nikki Herner, an expert in detective fiction. With mere months to live, Trapp invites Nikki to his spectacular San Francisco mansion to help draft his life story. While living alongside his beautiful second wife, Diana, 
his wayward nephew Freddie, and his protective daughter Madeline. Soon, Nikki finds herself caught in an irresistible case of real-life detective fever. 20 years earlier, on New Year's Eve 1999, Sebastian's first wife and teenage son vanished from different locations, never to be seen again. Did the perfect crime writer commit the perfect crime? And why has he emerged from seclusion two decades later to allow a stranger to dig into his past? As Nikki attempts to weave together the strands of Sebastian's life, she becomes obsessed with discovering the truth, while Madeline begins to question that what her beloved father might actually know about that long ago night. And when a corpse appears in the family's koi pond, both women are shocked to find that the past isn't gone, just waiting. That's all for this week's list. Maybe you found something new and exciting to pick up, or at least add to the TBR pile. If you enjoyed this one, you can go check out some of my other videos. And if you like my style, you'll consider subscribing. That way you can come back every Monday to find new books to add onto that list. I hope you're running something awesome for you today, and I'll see you in the next one.